I'm Tony Clark from the Carter Presidential Library and Museum. Welcome. Uh, I think this is going to be a, a fascinating, fascinating evening. But before we get to that, I want to do a couple of things. First of all, I'd like to get a show of hands. How many of you have never been to the Carter Presidential Museum? Okay, a lot of you. You know what? You've only got, what, four days to get there. Um, the museum is going to close. Sunday is the last day the Carter Presidential Museum is going to be open. It will close uh, after Sunday. We will be closed for five months. We're doing a $10 million complete redesign of the museum uh, by one of the, the country's foremost uh, museum designer, Gallagher and Associates. They did the Spy Museum in uh, Washington, D.C. They did uh, the new visit Visitor Center at Gettysburg. They're just, they're really good. But I would encourage you to go see the museum before we close. Also see a wonderful uh, exhibit on Abraham Lincoln that's there. Also, one other show of hands. How many of you have never been to one of our author lectures before? Okay, see, there's another one. Okay. We do a number of author lectures uh, at the Carter Presidential Library and Museum, many of which are uh, free. In fact, there is one tomorrow night, a uh, new novel by uh, Mark Fitton, uh, set in, in a Hungarian village that is really good. Or a week from today, the 29th of April, 7 o'clock, here in the chapel, Dara Tori. She is the Olympic silver medalist, previous gold medalist. She has a new book that's called Age is Not a Number. She will be here speaking and signing copies of, of her book. So I encourage you to pick up one of these sheets, uh, see what the authors we have uh, coming. In fact, uh, we just lined up uh, Pat Conroy. Uh, uh, he's coming in August. There's another one, Gary Pomerantz, is coming in June. And so uh, I would encourage you to attend our author lectures. It was 120 years ago today that my great-grandfather participated in the land run in Oklahoma in 1889 and homesteaded. And on that day, you had people from all over the, the country going to a new land, uh, what had been Indian territory, uh, to, to find, to start anew. Now, that, granted, was 120 years ago, and the situation was much different. But we have had a situation in, in Clarkston, we have seen in, in Clarkston, Georgia, where people from around the world, different cultures, have come together uh, to find a new life in a new land. And Warren St. John uh, has done a, a wonderful service, I think, in documenting the way the, the community has been able to, to come together and show that melting pot really is the, the thing that this country is, is made of and can congratulate itself for. So please join me in welcoming Warren St. John. Um, thank you so much for coming out. It's a um, lovely crowd and exciting night. I really want to um, thank some, some people who've helped probably um, lure or um, maybe harass some of you to, to come out tonight. Um, and if I thanked everyone, um, this would be sort of like reading the Atlanta phone book. You know, we'd be here for a couple of days. So um, I, I'll try to um, edit the list a little bit. Um, but uh, first, I'd like to thank Agnes Scott College uh, for spreading the word among its students uh, and faculty. Uh, Darren Wong, um, the executive director of the Decatur Book Festival, has been a, a machine in helping uh, to get the word out. Um, Brett Young was my uh, Facebook uh, captain, so if you've got 800 Facebook emails, um, don't hold him entirely responsible. I kept harassing him to send another one out. Um, I'd like to thank the board of the Fuji's family um, and Nancy Dietz, who hosted a, a gathering just beforehand, and um, RISA, uh, Refugee Resettlement and Immigration Services of Atlanta. Did I get that right? Um, and, um, and, of course, I'd like to thank Frank Reese and everyone at Acapella Books and Tony Clark and everyone um, here at the Carter Center. And, um, and I really want to thank um, a couple more people. 
uh, Luma Muffla and Tracy Adiger, who um, uh, run and founded and coach and uh, do all the things that the Fuji's family um, does. And and uh, I'd especially like to single out some of or, or the entire uh, group of Fuji's who've come out uh, tonight, and maybe we could give them a round of applause. I'd say one other thing, and I think this is just um, speaks to the uh, excitement in the community um, about um, the Fujis and what uh, they've accomplished. Um, I also want to thank the, the little shop of stories in Decatur. This is, um, you know, I've been, uh, this is my second book. I've done a lot of author events, and I can't ever recall a case where a bookstore uh, sent out a word to its uh, customers about an event put on by uh, the competition. And I think that um, that speaks to um, just the support and the enthusiasm in the community for the Fujis and what they've accomplished. Um, I'm going to talk just for a few minutes about the book and how it came to be and what some of the bigger lessons are that I hope um, readers will take from it. And then I'm going to introduce uh, Coach Luma. and She's going to speak for 20 minutes. And I think this will be um, yeah, Coach Luma. And, um, and I think this would be a more satisfying um, evening for all of us if um, we can get a little conversational. And we'd like to take questions uh, at, at the end for the, the final sort of uh, third um, of our time. Uh, and so I hope as, as we're speaking, some of you will, will think of questions and, and one of you will step up and be, be that brave soul um, to ask the first question about a book you can't possibly have read yet. Um, so I, I get this a, asked this question all the time, um, and it, some, it puzzles me a little bit, um, the, the, the incredulousness with which some people ask it. You know, how did you hear about um, the Fugees? As if, um, uh, you know, the idea that uh, someone in New York City could ever hear of anything happening beyond the Hudson River um, was uh, some sort of strange miracle. And I guess in, in a way it was a miracle for me. Um, I was here in Atlanta uh, talking about my, uh, my first book, which couldn't have uh, less to do with the subject matter of this book, um, and, um, and a, a now friend, um, but then someone I, I didn't really know at all, and I, he, I think he's here, Spencer Hall, um, uh, asked me to have a hamburger, uh, join, join him and his uh, wife for a hamburger, and we went out, and he worked in uh, what to me was this uh, opaque world of refugee resettlement. And I think over the course of the hamburger, um, my reporter uh, Gene kicked in, and I just started asking him one question after another: Refugees from where? Uh, how how are they resettled? Who resettles them? How is that going? What does the community uh, think about this process? And uh, sometime late in the in the dinner, uh, he sort of uh, casually said, "Well, there's a soccer team of refugee kids in Clarkston, and you should." Maybe check them out. Um, I was on assignment down south for the for the New York Times um, at the t at the time, so I was able to stick around for a little bit. And I uh, called Coach Luma and asked when they were playing next. And so I went to a game and I described uh, in the introduction uh, what happened. Uh, in a nutshell, you know, I had no expectations. I was not. Um, I didn't think I was looking for any. You know, my next big story. I was just a reporter. Um, who was curious, but I showed up and I watched um, a game uh, with a team from the suburbs, and the, the coach of this team was um, very vocal, to put it sort of nicely. Um, he liked to tell his players uh, what to do, um, all of them, at the same time. Um, and, and I noticed that this coach of the, of the refugee team um, wasn't saying particularly much. Um, and the game sort of... Um, uh, got to halftime, and it was three to one in favor of the Fujis. And in, in my experience of, of watching soccer, which is not totally limited, I've been to European soccer matches um, a couple of times and watched a lot of soccer and played the game uh, terribly in high school. I thought three to one at halftime was, you know, this was the stuff that would make any soccer coach uh, very happy. 
So I trotted over with, with my notebook to hear the halftime speech. And um, I think it's fair to say the coach wasn't happy. And her uh, chief complaint was, had nothing to do with the score. The score seemed irrelevant. Um, it, her, her, uh, her problem was that the players were not playing uh, to their ability. They were not playing the game the way they had been coached. And in particular, she was frustrated that uh, they weren't playing the game beautifully. Um, this was a sort of standard that um, she kept coming back to in the conversation, in my notes. She kept saying, I want you to play beautiful soccer. Why aren't you playing beautiful soccer? And um, at that moment, we heard the opposing coach all the way at the other end of the soccer complex um, doing kind of a Vince Lombardi routine, um, really giving it to his troops. And Luma's eyes narrowed, and she said, uh, or words to this effect, um, you see that coach over there? I want you to keep scoring until he sits down and shuts up. <laughs> and I'm taking notes, writing all this down, and I look down at what I've written in my notebook, and I think, wow, okay, this is interesting. Um, the second half starts, and, uh, and the Fugees uh, start passing the ball with a little bit more crispness uh, than they'd shown in the first half, and they quickly score a goal. And they score another goal. And they keep scoring goals. Um, sometime late in the game, when it was 8-2, uh, to two, the opposing coach, uh, with a very weary expression on his face, uh, wiped uh, the back of his arm on his forehead and sat down with a very defeated posture um, on, the be on the bench. And I noticed on the field um, smiles of satisfaction <laughs> on the faces of the Fugees who then scored another goal. <laughs> and the final of this uh, game then was 9-2. to two. Um, And I left completely uh, blown away. I, I, I have difficulty even recounting what happened next. Um, and this is the thing about this talk that where I hope you'll forgive me. I have to be careful about anecdotes because um, I start to lose it when I start recounting some of the anecdotes for my reporting. So... Um, you're going to have to get those on the page so that I, I embarrass myself up here tonight. Um, but after the game, the, the referee actually came over, and he was an older, experienced referee, and he asked Luma if he could speak to her players. And I, I could tell that this seemed to make her uh, uncomfortable, the idea of sort of handing the reins over to a stranger, and she had no idea what he was going to say. Um, but he's, what he said was, um, basically, uh, I appreciate that as the game went on, the other team got very frustrated um, and started sort of hacking at your ankles and not playing the ball um, and, and, and trying to retaliate in the, in the way that a team might when it's losing uh, nine to two. Um, he said, I appreciate that you didn't retaliate back. And so I, I want to compliment you on your sportsmanship. And he paused and, uh, and said something like, um, sort of under his breath, uh, and that was the most beautiful half of soccer I've ever seen. Um, so here I am, a reporter from New York, who stumbled onto this um, soccer game with uh, very low expectations of, of drama, um, and, uh, and I'm, I'm looking for Kleenex in my pocket on, uh, uh, on the sideline. And I got back to, to New York and told a few friends what I'd seen and said, am I, am I crazy? Is this interesting to you? And, and they had more questions, um, just as I did. And so I began to look into Clarkston, Georgia, and try to understand what was happening in Clarkston. Big question, of course, is how did so many people from so many places around the world end up in uh, a little town east of Atlanta? And it turned out um, that many residents of Clarkston uh, had been wondering the same thing for quite a while. Um, and this was interesting to me. Um, this was... Clarkston ended up being this kind of complicated social experiment that no one really planned on. Um, no one intended it to happen. And very simply, the reasons for um, resettlement in Clarkston were that resettlement agencies, uh, when they're looking uh, for places to, to um, resettle refugees and help them get uh, a toehold on their new lives in this country, look for places with cheap housing, 
Um, they look for places that are, have access to public transportation. They look for places that are near economic centers that can support uh, jobs for these newcomers so that they can, um, they can have a shot at uh, economic self-sufficiency. And Little Clarkston fit the bill perfectly. You really um, couldn't have designed a sort of better community for resettlement on those terms. And so the refugees um, began coming from Southeast Asia in the, uh, in the late 80s, and it was a trickle. And then because it worked, uh, the numbers continued. And before too long, and before many in town realized what had fully happened, the town had, um, according to the 2000 census, about a third uh, of the residents were foreign born. I think pretty much everyone in Clarkston thinks that that was a, a low estimate. Um, and, and this struck me as fascinating. How do you make that work? Uh, Clarkston High School, when I was uh, reporting in 2006, had students from, uh, from 50 different countries, over 50 different countries. Um, how does a teacher make that work? How do police handle that situation? How do the residents themselves find any sense of commonality uh, across these extraordinary, extraordinary cultural uh, divides. And as I learned more about Clarkston, I began to realize that uh, it was a sort of, all of this together was a kind of reporter's dream. It was a story about uh, the hopes and aspirations of, of, of real people in a place uh, that was undergoing radical change. And then the radical change was a kind of change that's really happening all over this country albeit at a, at, a, at, a slower, at a slower rate. I think of Clarkson as sort of America on fast forward. Um, I think one of the themes of the book um, is it's an effort to understand a group of people who are caught between worlds. And I think that applies to almost everyone. Uh, the older residents of Clarkston uh, Many of them never went anywhere. They're in the same houses. And the world outside their front doors, uh, in short order, looked nothing like uh, it looked a few years before. Uh, refugee families, obviously, have come from extraordinarily difficult circumstances. And while they're, in my reporting, I sensed a great sense of gratitude to be in a place that was safe um, and to be away from immediate harm, they faced extraordinary economic challenges, but also more subtle and pervasive day-to-day -day challenges. Like, how do we fit in in this new place? Um, who, how do we find a, a place of our own in this society? How do we become part of this community? And I found when I was reporting that um, while there was a great deal of, uh, of guardedness about newcomers, um, in Clarkson for obvious reasons. They, I think their experience makes the threshold for trusting other people quite high. There was also a real curiosity about meeting an actual American. Here they were in the middle of America and meeting someone who was just an, a local, or maybe not from around here, but a local in the, in the most general sense, uh, was fairly rare because the apartment complexes house so many uh, foreigners, and or um, they never had a chance to converse with the Americans who were around. People were busy going about um, their daily business, commuting, worrying about their own families, and that sort of thing. And so I, I came up with this image um, when I was writing of, of sort of fish and birds um, looking at each other, uh, but in separate worlds and unable to cross over to each other's worlds um, to communicate. And I think, um, I think that's maybe the, the, um, the best context in which to understand the broader story that I've written about. Um, I think, as I said earlier, that, um, that it, I think it's important because this is where our country is headed. Um, in certain big cities around America, like New York, where I live, this is kind of the norm. We're used to meeting people from all over. And we've kind of figured out how to do that. But uh, in most other places, like in Birmingham, where I grew up, um, it's still fairly rare to actually interact with someone who's from another culture. They're there, you see them, um, but you may not speak to them. You may not actually encounter them 
and um, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And I think that that's what ended up happening uh, in Clarkston. I think there was a, a bit of an irony, um, at least as far as the Fujis go, in that um, there, was, there was so much similarity between what Luma was teaching the kids and what she is teaching the kids and the values that we all um, in this country hold dear or claim to hold dear, sense of personal responsibility, self-reliance, a work ethic, a willingness to help other people. Um, th this is the message that I saw Luma drilling into her players day in and day out. And I know it's, it's a, those are values that um, an older resident in town would hold um, dear as well. But because of this fish and birds quality of life in this town, there is a precious little opportunity to find that common ground. And I think um, ultimately that's what uh, this book is about. It's about, um, it's about people uh, powering through those difficulties and Im improvising their way uh, towards understanding. And I think in some ways that's the great, um, that's the great American story. That's what we've done for our history. It's just sometimes when you're very close to it and very close to the action, it's hard to see that that's what's going on, that the mistakes people make, uh, the fears that people express are actually clumsy attempts to protect their own safety while still uh, giving room for other people to have their lives in respectful ways. So um, with that context, I'm going to pass it over to Luma. She's going to talk for a few minutes, and then I'd like to take questions and talk about uh, maybe we can get a, a little bit more into the details of the reporting and the story and uh, the Q&A. I'm not going to speak for 20 minutes. I might speak for 5 or 10, but it's not going to be 20. Um, my limit is usually 10 minutes because that's uh, how long a halftime speech is. So I'm going to talk to you about how I initially met the Fujis. Um, I was driving around in Clarkson going to a Middle Eastern grocery store um, to Lars uh, so I could find some food for my country. I'm originally from Jordan, a uh, small country in the Middle East. And on my way back, I forgot to take the turn. And so I kept driving and did a U-turn into one of the apartment complexes. And in that apartment complex, there's a group of kids playing soccer. And they were playing the game the way I used to play it, out in the streets with no parents, no rules, a raggedy ball, and no shoes. Um, and, for that, and during that time, I had been coaching a team at our local YMCA, and I had been coaching them for four years, and... The game had gotten overly competitive. The parents were very involved and wanting wins and weren't agreeing necessarily with the philosophy of my coaching. Um, I was a little homesick. Um, my business was running me ragged. Um, and so that was the highlight of my day. And so I came back later in the week to watch the kids play. And this time I came out with a ball, a much nicer ball than the one they had. And I approached them, and I asked them if I could play. And they were very hesitant. It was a group of Afghan boys and a couple of Sudanese kids. And they looked at me, and it was a woman approaching them to play soccer. And they weren't so sure about this. So they got in their little huddle trying to debate whether I can play with them. But ultimately, the soccer ball won out. I had a much nicer ball. So they let me play. And they t told me which team I could be on. And I was on the team with the really chubby kid and the short one. So <laughs> that day began my... Um, roller coaster with the Fujis. Um, eventually, I started coming out a lot. Um, I would tell my staff I was out running errands, getting bread. I know some of you here don't, didn't know that. Um, my one-hour errand would turn into three. And finally, you know, like I started telling the kids, and they knew I was a coach, and I asked them if they wanted to form a team, and they got really excited about it. And they thought they were going to be professional soccer players. But... That wasn't the case, not yet. And so uh, we started flyering the neighborhoods. They started recruiting their friends. I went around and approached kids in the neighborhood that were about the right size, asking them if they would want to join the team. Um, 
and I did not chase them down the street, even if they tried to tell you that, right, Josiah? Okay. Um, and we formed, uh, the first day we had tryouts, we had 30 kids come out. And they came out to play in this big open field, and everybody was running around like crazy. No one had any equipment. Um, and there's this one kid that was just all over the place. And I'd given them positions at the beginning, and he wasn't holding his position. But I didn't know his name because he was one of 30 kids that came out that day. And I tried to get his attention. I couldn't get it. And finally I asked Noor, one of the Afghan kids I knew. I was like, Noor, what's his name? And he looked at me and looked at him and then turned around and grinned. He's like, that's one shoe. I'm like, that's one shoe. And I look over, and this kid has one huge oversized, oversized sneaker on. And, <laughs> and th that was one shoe. And he played like crazy, not a care in the world, didn't care he didn't have any shoes or any cleats or anything, and came off the field after practice was over, wiped down this huge shoe um, that was too big for him, and put it in his backpack and then put his flip-flops on and got ready to walk two miles home. He was eight years old, and um, I looked down at my uh, brand new kangaroo leather cleats that I had just ordered for my new season, never more ashamed in my life, um, and put them away that night, promising never to pull them out until all my kids could wear the same cleats I could. And it was a series of events like this that led me to where I am today. Um, there were times where the kids after practice would ask for help for tutoring, and so I would go from one place to the other to the other, coming home at 11 or midnight, and that wasn't going to work. So we started a tutoring program and partnered with Risa to start it off and, um, you know, got involved with the kids, families, and, <clears throat> sorry, this is new to me, um, got involved with their families and figured out what their needs were. Um, uh, the way we approach things, the way I approach things, I don't go in with a master plan of how to do things. I don't read in a textbook or in some academic book, oh, this is how you need to deal with diversity or kids from different countries or teenage boys. I go in and learn, and they teach us. And they teach us which direction to go and what they need. And so from the soccer teams, we went to having tutoring, to starting our own school, because a lot of our kids were failing in the public school system. And that's the way we're going to continue to grow. Um, I know a lot of the focus has been on our field issue and all that stuff, but the thing is, is that's so small compared to everything else we deal with on a day-to-day -day level. And <clears throat> I would love to tell stories all night about them, and they're looking at me, wanting me to tell a story about each one of them. But the thing is, I have 86 boys that I coach right now, and I can't do that. And we got 14 of them here tonight to represent the team, and these are my favorites for the week. <laughs> don't get too excited. Um, so they're the ones that are here today. Um, I don't like talking at people, except my kids at halftime. So we're going to open it up for questions and hopefully start a conversation with everyone here. Okay, thank you. What we'd like to do, we have microphones over here and here. We'd like for you to line up. I do ask one thing. Um, it's very easy to stand up and your question goes on and on and on and on. Please make your question a, a question. I'm going to stay up here just to make sure. Uh, but please, uh, <laughs> uh, if you have questions, and this is a great opportunity to, uh, to ask questions, come to our microphones over here and here, and we will, uh, we will recognize you. I think we have our first question. Hello, everybody. My name is Vikas. I'm from ne Nepal. I came to America last year, and I, like, I live in Glaston, and I want to know how I can join the Fuji team. Please. Sit down. <laughs> How old are you? I'm 18 now. And 18? Uh, I have four brothers. Uh, yeah. 
I, I have four brothers. They are sitting in the back, behind. And uh, my, my brother's name is Prakash, John, <laughs> Isaac, and uh, Prakash. They are first. They are sitting there. Okay, tryouts are going to be the first week of June. Um, do you know any of the kids here? Do you go to Clarkson High School? Yeah, I know. Samuel is going to tell you when tryouts are. Okay? Okay. Thank All you right? so much. And, no, 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 we're not done. <laughs> now, we need you to play. So that means we need the people in the audience to support you playing, right? So they're all going to go to Fuji'sFamily.org tonight and donate to make sure you can play because we already have 86 kids and now we have to have a lot more, right? You're good. Okay, thank you so thank much. You. My name is Millie Linville, and I'm going to, my question was exactly what you had just addressed. People are here from the community, and after hearing your story, we want to help. So if you can address specific ways that community members can help, what are you looking for, if not just in monetary funds? Okay. Um, you, you can come and volunteer. We always need volunteer tutors. Um, you have to um, be a college graduates are, are currently in college to tutor our kids. We tutor uh, four nights a week, um, Monday through Friday, 4.30 to 7.30. Sorry, it's been a long day. Um, but ultimately, uh, we're a very small organization, and we're very grassroots, and we're um, one of the only uh, refugee organizations that does not accept government funding. And we do that intentionally so we can have a deep impact on our kids and not do numbers, and, um, and the only way we do that is with donations. And this is not something I'm very comfortable with. I would rather be out at practice right now with the kids, um, but this comes with the job. And so um, get your friends to sign up, five or ten bucks a month. That's all it's going to take to get us going, and come out and volunteer. Um, you can come and cheer for their uh, games um, if you get on our volunteer list. Um, they tend to really show off when they have people coming to cheer for them because it doesn't happen often enough. Um, and then you will see the beautiful game. Thank you. Uh, with regard to um, having your own school and your own tutoring and, uh, and a team comprised of the young men that it is, uh, Mr. St. John talked earlier about assimilation and a melting pot and all that. Is that a concern for you that over, over the years if the... Uh, if the fellows stay in this own, their own group, that there will be difficulty as they graduate from high school and go to college or go into occupations, that they're more used to being with their own fellows over the years rather than moving into the community at large. They live in the community, so their time with us is not 24-7. And part of it is, is that healing process, that time where they need to come to this country and adjust. And I'm not even talking about adjusting as refugees. I'm, let's talk about just adjusting as immigrants. It's really tough to come to this country. And so I, I think the way our program works is we empower them, we make them feel proud of who they are, and we give them a sound education so they can integrate into college, which is the ultimate integration and the ultimate American dream. Um, so it's not isolation, but empowerment. I'd like, to, I'd like to say something about that as well. I think um, one of the things I noticed in my reporting, and there's, you, you'll read a lot about this um, in the book, is that the, the stress that I saw was um, among uh, refugee boys wasn't things that they talked about in their past. It was what was happening every day. And, what was happening, um, you know, we've all been preteens or teenagers. It's a pretty rocky time under the best of circumstances. And what I repeatedly saw was uh, kids who wanted to fit in. They wanted to be accepted by their peers. They wanted to belong. So they go to school. They adopt American uh, customs, and they start to dress American and speak American. And then they go home, and mom or mom or dad says, you know, we don't walk around with our shirts untucked in Africa. You tuck your shirt in. Or that's not how we wear our hair where we come from. And so I saw kids trying to negotiate this space between these two worlds where um, at school American kids might think they were different because they had an accent or they didn't know what country they came from, never heard of it. And then they'd go home and they'd get a little bit of the same but from a different direction. And what I saw that was sort of miraculous with the Fugees, was it was this one place that kids could go where 
everyone was so different that there was no normal that people were trying to fit into or aspire to. Everyone was different and it was just understood that everyone, that individuals are radically different from each other. And so everyone's different, so let's move on. And I think that in that safe space where um, people are not trying hard to fit in constantly, um, that's where confidence blossoms, that's where people get relaxed. And I saw kids when I first showed up with my notebook um, who didn't speak a word of English, who were very shy, very withdrawn, and by the end of the, ver the very season I reported on, were shouting uh, commands in English uh, to their uh, fellow defenders during a game. And um, now one of those uh, players uh, is tutoring English to newcomers, whereas when 2006 in the fall when I showed up, um, I don't think he spoke a word of English. Um, so I think that, that could be a concern, um, but you have, to, you have to have a base of confidence and self-esteem, I think, before you can you know, reasonably expect to connect uh, with others. And I, I, I was impressed with the way the, the Fugees provided that opportunity. Um, thank you both for telling us stories about the Fugees. Um, I wonder if you could, Luma, you could select a couple of the Fugees to tell us stories about the two of you. <laughs> Josiah? Come here, come here. Come here. Okay, ju just to give you the heads up, Josiah has a uh, tendency to embellish and exaggerate. Um, but go ahead. Do you have a specific question? Like, is, he wants either a story about Warren or I or... Oh. Or yourself. Oh. All right. <laughs> I mean, like, after halftime, coach usually tell us to do this. I mean, don't laugh. You know, it's going to be funny. But she usually say this. Come over here. Every one of you. No water. No water. Come over here. Now. <laughs> Sit down. But you know, when she does that, and every one of us is like, whoa, she's taking it hard on us. And then she's like, you guys are playing like craps out there. You guys are playing like bunch of bubble bees. Come on, that's not what I taught you. And then, you know, then everybody will be like, whoa, guys, I think we need to play like a team because Coach is very mad at us. And then, and then we get it together. And then the next, after the game, she'll be like, that's how you play. And then I'll be like, whoa. So we didn't play like bumblebees or anything. She's like, no, you guys fixed it up and stuff. So that's how it is, Coach Luma. <laughs> tendency to exaggerate and embellish, so don't. Hi, this question is for both of you. Um, President Obama and his support for the 2018-2022 World Cup bids for the U.S. talked about his time playing street soccer in Jakarta, and I just want to ask the both of you if you think that soccer in particular will help make this country less isolated and more uh, connected to the world. Um, I think the answer is, is absolutely. Um, you know, there's a perception that soccer isn't, you know, an American game. And um, he's, he probably has um, pollsters and, and political uh, minds who are much savvier about this than I could ever be. But in um, Georgia alone, uh, there are 75,000 kids who play youth soccer. Um, so it is an American game. And... Um, and maybe it's marginalized a little bit in our culture compared to some of the other pro sports, but I think there's a great opportunity um, to connect um, our love of the sport um, with the absolute incredible passion for the sport uh, around the world. And I think, you know, just in, in, in this community, you can see um, what soccer can do. You know, in soccer, um, people aren't hiding behind face masks or helmets. They're right there face to face and um, the game has this beautiful fluidity to it, and um, people talk to each other even during the game, and there's a tremendous uh, potential to just connect on the field. And I know from my reporting that you know, there's no better place to meet someone and have a conversation on, on the sidelines of a soccer game. 
and I think that's where a lot of friendships are forged. So sports um, are social things, spectator sports. Um, people come out in public for them, and they mingle with each other. And so I think um, that's a very savvy um, political move, but I also think he, he happens to, to be right. Why did you decide to write the book? <laughs> My wife keeps asking me that question. <laughs> um, I decided to write the book because um, I felt that, um, that I had the kind of rarest of, of things for a reporter, and that is a story that was personal and touching um, and, and could draw you in emotionally but that was also very important. And by that I mean, I think the lessons of what's happening in, in this little town down the road uh, apply to all of our lives. And the connections, the, the way that the Fujis, kids from completely different cultures and backgrounds and religions who didn't speak the same languages, the way they figure out uh, how to connect and the framework that Luma provides um, offers all of us uh, some guidance on how we might do it. And I think the thing that really, that I really liked personally about Luma and, and reporting was that um, she never claimed to have a system of answers where everything was sort of neatly figured out. These are people just trying their best to make a complicated situation work. And I think you could say, you could use that line to describe our country's history. This place shouldn't really work the way it does. We're just from too many different places, and we have too many different interests. And somehow it does, and it's this grand, uh, incredibly um, uh, nurturing environment where people can express themselves. And so I saw in the Fuji story um, something that could teach us something, but something that might also touch people emotionally. And so that's, um, that's why I decided to, to write the book. Hi, my name is Anne, and on a personal note, I just want to say thank you to the Fujis. Um, I'm, I, I'm in Atlanta. Um, I came here and found a fantastic job at the International Community School because I followed the story on the front page of the New York Times about the Fujis. Um, ICS is a, a school where many of you might know half the students are actually refugees, and I teach third grade. And I know that one of the dreams for many of the children in third grade is to be a member of the Fujis. Um, and I note that you say you don't receive any government money because of the technicalities and the limitations. But I also know that being a refugee is an actually an official kind of a status. So I'm wondering if children have been born here as families of refugees, or how do you decide who is a refugee and who isn't and who can actually be a member of the Fujis? I don't have a system for deciding that. Um, I think I should probably do one now before people are up in arms about it, about the technicalities of it. Um, we don't recruit kids. The kids recruit their friends from their neighborhoods. Um, and I've never turned a kid away. I had uh, one native-born kid come out the first year, and he quit uh, at the end of the season because he wanted to play basketball. It wasn't by intention. It, it, this is just the way it ended up. Um, I don't, does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah. yeah. It, it means that maybe my third graders, when they're old enough, could be Fuji's. Yes, and you know, like, we're also restricted by space and facilities, and yeah, I wish every child in the world could be a Fuji. But <laughs> I, I don't know if that's going to happen anytime Thank soon. You. So. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Shakira Ramsey. Uh, I've actually had the pleasure of being a tutor um, at the Fuji's organization. I can uh, personally verify that it is a top-notch organization that is devoted to the growth and uh, the pursuit of happiness, which we all are in pursuit of here in America for all these young gentlemen. So, I mean, my hat goes off to, to Luma and the rest of our organization for doing such a great job. My question to you, Luma, is um, I mean, it's clear that you're a visionary, and while your organization has started organically and it's worked. For the most part, where do you see uh, the Fuji's family going five to ten years from now? What, if you could paint a, a citadel on a hill, so to speak, what, what, what would be, uh, you know, how would that be embodied in the Fuji's family 
No restrictions? No restrictions. No restrictions. And, if, and if, you know, you could cite specific examples, whether uh, it's, you know, uh, particular alumni graduating and coming back to help. Like, what would Well, we do have that cycle going on right now. Okay. Um, Shamsun, who is our first uh, student to go to college, uh, who's Edouard's brother, is coming back this summer and interning with us at our summer camp. Um, you know, my ultimate dream is to have one of the Fujis come back and run the organization so I can start it somewhere else or retire. Um, <laughs> But we do have a new vision, not a new vision, but a, a direction that we are pursuing, um, and I will YouTube it tonight after this event, but we want to create our own school and have the school be the center of our community um, for our kids, uh, you know, a private school um, for boys 6th to 12th grade that combines athletics and academics for them, that allows them to catch up because they've lost so many years of formal schooling and then allows them to ultimately integrate, um, you know, have our own community, uh, vibrant, loving, most of the time, um, getting along. Um, so, thank you. I have a pretty simple question for Luma, and so I'm going to reveal my ignorance of life in Jordan. So how common is it for girls and young women to be playing soccer? Um, <laughs> I, I grew up in a very privileged family, a very westernized family, so um, it was never an issue for them for me to play. Um, and I had two brothers growing up, and so anytime my parents signed them up for a sport or anytime they would be playing outside, I would participate. My parents never told me no. They never told me, no, you can't wear shorts, no, you can't do this, um, because they believed if I was playing sports, I wouldn't be getting in trouble elsewhere. And I think it did keep me out of a lot of trouble, so. That's perfect for my question. Do you think one day you might coach the Lady Fujis? No. Um, I tried, and I failed. Um, we, tr we tried to round up a group of girls, and we couldn't get one small age group. It was a very wide um, age range, and it's, it's tough for me to say that because I graduated from a women's college I come from a country where most women don't have the opportunity to play, so I wanted to start up with a girls' team. Um, but there are other programs in town that do stuff for girls, maybe not soccer, but there's other things for them. There is nothing else for my boys. And we, we need to address teenage boys, and there's a lot of funding and a lot of momentum around girls. But with me and my passion and my direction, it's, it's with them. You said you've never turned anyone away, um, but I, I believe the, the director of the Clarkson Community Center asked you if, uh, if his sons could participate, and you told him no. Why is that? Okay. Um, he was on another team. At that point, our team had become the Fujis, had developed its own identity, had involved tutoring, and we were starting to address the very specific needs of refugees. So here was a kid from a middle-class family who had opportunities to play at other clubs, who did not need my tutoring support or any of the other support I was offering these kids. Um, like I told you, we never had you know, a system in place, and I think now, because of the popularity, is why we had to do it. And he didn't approach me for his kid to join my team. He approached me for his kid to practice with my team, which is a very different thing. Oh. Thank you for answering that. Yep. Um, I really appreciate, Warren St. John, your characterization of the mistakes that are often made and in trying to meld these things together. And it is a very difficult thing. And as a member of the resettlement community, I'm very sensitive to how difficult the process is. And for that reason, um, it does, this idea of community is really significant to me. And, and well, on the one hand, I, I'm thrilled with what the Fujis have brought. On the other hand, I am concerned about the tensions that the Fujis have created in the community. And I'm wondering, Luma, if you could comment on mistakes that you think you've made in that process. Can you comment specifically about the tensions that are there between the Fujis and the community right now? Well, you, you, you spoke earlier about the field issue, mm -hmm. and I've heard a lot of different rumors about that issue. And, and I would just love to hear it from your own your own mouth, what you think the, the, the issue is. Well, I was talking about the issue being minuscule compared to everything else that we deal with, and I was also talking about this happening two years ago. 
So since this incident has happened, we have been practicing at Milam Park, at Armistead Field, sorry, um, four days a week. Um, and we do our home games at Ashford Dunwoody because that's the regulation size game. Um, I th do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I would just say also that um, you know, a lot of that stuff in, that came out in the Times article, you know, the Times article was a snapshot in time. Um, that was fall of 2006. Um, I filed my story the day before Christmas um, and then made a few changes a week um, later um, when there was other news to add. But um, I think if you'll, you'll see in the book, um, you know, and that's what the book is all about, and I think that's what this evening is about, um, is, uh, you know, things aren't stagnant. And um, I know personally that people who, um, when I was reporting, had no particular interest in the Fugees in Clarkston, you might call them sort of old guard, um, are involved and supportive of the program in active ways now. And that's just, when I talked earlier about our country's remarkable ability to imp improvise its way out of the most complicated of social situations, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And it's, there's no neat um, the end to this story. The story is. Um, and, and so there will always be headaches. But I think one thing that's definitely true is there's a lot more communication uh, going because I think maybe people feel a little bit more free to express their own frustrations and opinions um, as a result of uh, the conversation that's been ongoing. Great. Well, thanks for writing the story. Thanks. Hi, I have two questions. Excuse me, I have two questions. Um, one, how long has the Fuji's been in existence? And two, um, I, NPR did a piece this afternoon on the Fuji's in your book, and that's how I found out about this this evening. And they were talking about Hollywood being interested in Clarkston and the Fuji's, and I wondered if, um, if anyone has approached you about making a movie from your book yet. Well... Uh, the, the answer is yes, and it's like everything out there. It's part of some glacial process that I can't possibly understand. So um, I, I look forward um, to, you know, getting uh, wheeled out of the retirement home for the premiere. Um, um, and, and, and because that's, it's, it's so far off and such a sort of, I mean, truly a fairy tale, um, it's all, it, it's interesting when people ask about it because I guess we all have a natural fa fascination with things Hollywood, but it's so far removed from uh, anything that's going on on the ground in terms of the needs of the community um, that it's just sort of a running joke um, be between the two of us and, and everybody else. Okay. And how long has um, the Fuji's been in existence? So this is my 10th season with the team, and our organization has been around for three years now. Thank you uh, both. Thank you, Luma, for your compassion and um, just for your commitment. And thank you, Warren, for bringing attention to the story. Um, my question is about the, just the community's reaction. And I guess as a reporter, in your experience in covering the story, um, what has given you kind of, what has made you cynical about the community's reaction? What has given you optimism uh, kind of going forward for um, <laughs> For just for our country in terms of integrating. Um. Sure. Um, well, I'd say nothing's made me cynical. Um, but, and I think there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of calls for optimism. I mean, I think that's, that's my default position anyway as a, as a citizen of the world, and I think that's probably reflected in my work. But um, as I said, you know, I parachuted into, um, you know, I, I, in the book I talk about this study by just give me one second to be a little bit academic because I, I think it's important. There's a study by a Harvard political scientist named Bob Putnam who sent his researchers out to some of the most diverse communities in America, and he had them ask people questions about their lives. And what they found after interviewing 35,000 people was that people who live in extremely diverse communities are uh, less likely to vote. They watch more hours of TV the average American. They're more cynical about the media, less trusting of politicians. They're less uh, likely to be involved in community matters. And when the study came out, I think it was a sort of wake-up call because in a way it's not surprising. If you can't connect with your neighbors, um, what are you going to do? 
might watch a little TV. You might hang out behind the closed door of your apartment or your home. And as I read the Putnam study, and I talked to some of the older residents of Clarkston, um, you know, one of them, a, a city council member, I may even be here, um, said to me that when she moved to Clarkston, it was a community where people weren't c coming out of their houses, weren't talking to each other. And it's worth, it, it, this isn't a bit anyone's fault. This isn't about someone being, you know, making mistakes or being bad people. This is a, just a fact of the difficulty of uh, living in a diverse community. How do you talk to someone you can't talk to? How do you make them understand you? Um, and so um, what's really cool about the Fugees is you can clearly do it. And we've got an example every time they take the field of, uh, of people communicating with each other in various ways. And there are other examples in Clarkston. I talk in the book about Thrift Town, the grocery store, or the International Bible Church of Clarkston. The, you know, the old Clarkson Baptist Church, built, uh, founded in 1880, is now this crazy, diverse congregation where uh, African women in beautiful, colorful dress are sitting next to little sweet Southern ladies in their you know, 80s, 80s and 90s. Uh, the, you know, yes, they argue about music. Yes, there's some difficulty about what the potluck uh, dinner is going to look like. Um, <laughs> But it basically works, and people feel good about it. But you're never going to get to that point if you don't get out of the apartment. And I think you know, the, the message of my book, um, you know, not to be too didactic about it. I'm a reporter. You know, we, we cringe at anything didactic. But I think it's hard. it was hard for me after my reporting not to feel inspired about the possibilities for connecting. Because and I'll t say one other thing about that. I spoke to uh, someone here, um, actually saw her in the audience, I um, won't single her out, but she was talking about, to me about her work with Sudanese refugees. And she said um, that the work took her out of her comfort zone. I think I heard this the first week I was in Clarkson. I didn't really know what that meant. What does it mean to get out of your comfort zone? And, and then I got, a, I got an understanding of what that meant. When you're immersed in a world where everyone's different, you don't know if the things you're saying are polite or offensive to someone else in their culture. You second-guess yourself. You get tentative. You, you know, um, it, it can be uncomfortable if you're not with someone who's exactly like you. Um, but that's okay. That's not a terrible thing. Um, it's, it's only a terrible thing if you let that paralyze you into not ever engaging with other people. And, um, and so I think the story of the Fugees, um, for me, was kind of a kick in the pants to get out there um, Talk to people who look different, sound different, um, and, and I hope that's what people take away from it. How are we doing? Why don't we take just these questions over here, and then we're going to do the, uh, the book signing, so we'll, just, we'll leave it with, with these four people. Munda and Obai each have one short question for Mr. St. John. So I think maybe they can just go together. How long it took you to make this book? So how long did it take you to write the book, and? How did you come with the title? How did I come up with the title? Yes. Um, I, I stole the title um, from a colleague of mine at work. It was a subhead in the, um, in the story uh, that ran in the Times, Outcast United. And I liked it because um, you know, it has a little bit of a soccer ring, like Manchester United. But it also summed up to me uh, what was happening um, in, these, in these pockets in Clarkson, of people who were finding ways to connect with each other over these divides. And um, how long it, it took me to write the book. Um, you sound like my editor. Um, uh, it really took me about, well, this funny thing about books, you know, in, in my mind, uh, this, this book, I finished this book a long time ago. Um, I think uh, maybe, you know, the first draft I turned in in uh, September or October. Um, so I think it took about um, two years, um, including the um, you know, the features I did for the Times. And I know to a young person like you, that might sound like forever. Um, and to someone 39 years old, it sounds like forever um, as well. But, um, but it actually didn't feel that fast to me because I got to keep coming down. It was another excuse to come down and watch more Fuji's games. Hi, I don't really have a question, but I just had a statement, and you kind of pretty much a minute ago, answering the other gentleman's question, said what I was going to say. I'm 
a lifelong resident of Clarkson, and I'm here tonight with some several friends that are also longtime Clarkson residents. And um, about in the 90s, although the refugees have been coming since the 70s and the 90s, it just was such an influx. And now I'm blessed to work at the International Bible Church, and um, every Wednesday morning we have a ministry to the parents of many of these children that are uh, ESL students from DeKalb Tech. We let them use our education building. And that's exactly what I was going to say is step out of your comfort zone. And so many times we think, oh, this problem's too big, that problem's too big. I'm just one person. What can I do? Well, look at what Ms. Muffler's done. She was just one person. And the impact, Ms. Muffler, you always get so emotional, but the impact you're going to ma- you already have made and the long-term impact you are making on the lives of these boys is just going to be like a, a pebble in the pond and all the ripple effects are going to continue forever. And um, one thing we learned at our church was we had two choices. We could board up our doors and move out like many did, or we could stay and minister to who God sent us. We chose the latter, and one thing we have learned is one thing we have learned is that a smile is the same in every language. So please step out of your comfort zone. Thank you. I'm actually a player, former player, as well as a worker of the game of soccer. I've had the privilege to work at the uh, youth club, high school, college level, and just wanted to reiterate, it is generally a very privileged game. Um, If you're not familiar with it, it is one that takes um, quite a bit of equipment from uh, shin guards, socks, uniforms, balls, bags, cleats, uh, warm-ups, the list goes on and on, and, and those are, are vital. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate to Luma's point uh, the importance of donations um, and just how crucial it is. Um, so that's just my statement. And my question to you, both of you, really, is from the media coverage, have you seen other communities throughout the United States start to either replicate or form um, what you've done, or have you been contacted by you know, other coaches or communities throughout the U.S. that uh, are looking for inspiration or looking to replicate what you've done? Um, We've been contacted by uh, individuals and some organizations around the country and around the world about how they can do what we do. And like Warren mentioned, we don't have a set way to do it. And for me, my advice to you is, like the woman said, step out of your comfort zone, grab a ball, Go out into your community and do something. It's not that hard. And, you know, when you put people like me up saying, oh, this is so inspirational and what you've done, anyone can do it. It's not that big of a deal. Um, And for for us, it's as simple as taking out a soccer ball and getting to know people in your neighborhood, getting to know people in your streets. And, yeah. So we, 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 we are not doing replication just yet. Um, we believe very strongly in doing something, doing it well, and then possibly expanding. There, I mean, we've gotten emails, you know, from places that have a high refugee population, like Des Moines and Lewiston and St. Louis and uh, parts of Texas. Um, And there's this one kid, I read about him in a magazine, and he had read the New York Times article, and then that summer did a summer soccer camp for kids in his community. He was a 16-year-old kid, just rounded up soccer balls, his friends, and did it for uh, 10 to 12-year-olds in his community. Some of them were refugees, some of them weren't. All of them were low income. And it was the highlight of his summer, and it was the highlight of those kids' summers. So it's small things like that. And I think with the book coming out, maybe more people will be willing to take that step and do things and get more involved. Wasn't this a wonderful evening? Um, So, wait. So, um, we've uh, we've been very privileged in the past couple of years to be featured from, you know, 
initially the front page of the New York Times, the Today Show to ESPN, it's this spiral of publicity, and now the book um, that uh, Warren wrote about us. And um, I don't think the team has ever thanked you for it, but we got you a gift for your new baby daughter and for you uh, to welcome you. Well, you are part of our family, but here you go. 